Hello, everybody, and welcome to Leadership with me, Bill, uh, the company's expert. And I want to thank my channel members, Patreon, super thanks donors for supporting me. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, and thank you for being here. You guys obviously want to improve yourselves and maybe you have ambitions to be in upper management in some capacity. So this is the live stream where we're talking about everything related to upper management, some of the skills needed, some of the challenges you face, uh, some of the concepts involved. Uh, so this is the second live stream. I think I should do this right now. This, this means something rude. This uh, is the second live stream in the series I've done. I was asked to do another one of these. And quite frankly, I jumped at the chance because uh, any excuse to do it because I like talking about this stuff. So yeah, uh, if you're not familiar with me, I'm a former CEO. I've been the CEO of a smaller company uh, several years ago, and I've spent my whole life, the first half of my career in sort of corporate culture, working for large blue chip companies over a couple of industries. And then second half of my career is in smaller companies, uh, small and medium enterprise, and uh, coaching startups and teaching in university on the side. So that's who I am. And we're going to be t covering a few things about um, upper management today, but just want to remind everybody this is also a uh, interactive live chat. So if you see um, the chat box near somewhere near my face, uh, get in the chat and uh, you can ask me whatever you want. Really, there's no way of stopping you. Uh, I'll see if I can help you if I can. Um, so uh, Yusef is here uh, like like before watching. Oh, well, thank you. That's a vote of confidence. And live cricket says hi. P.S. Debbie says hi. Um, get like postcards. Um, so for want of a place to start off today, apart from thanking the 15 of you that are here, uh, I wanted to talk about kind of a concept that maybe you're not familiar with if you've never worked in upper management before. Uh, this concept of a delineation. There's kind of two areas of of management, if ever you're wondering, okay? Um, for want of a better term, there's corporate management. And then I don't know if these have official terms, but what I call them is intra SBU management. So just if you're working within a business unit, managing a business unit, that's one area, okay? Uh, but if you are on top of several business units and you're wondering how to coordinate them and how to administrate them, that's corporate management. And corporate management is very similar to the world of investors, okay? And it's very similar to the world of finance. It, you need a lot of knowledge of finance usually to do corporate management, okay? That's where you sit on top of individual business units. So you may work at a company where, you know, they have different products or different divisions. Some provide services, some sell products. Maybe they're in different regions of the world, you know, this kind of thing, right? Those are all business units. Right. So each of those is a money making venture. It sells something. It's responsible for its own costs. It covers its own costs and it makes its own revenue. OK, so it's usually run by some kind of manager, usually an executive. Usually they're ahead of a division. Right. And that executive deals with that division. OK, so they might be in a certain business. And that executive comes from that business. They know that business inside and out, right? Maybe they don't know much about what the rest of the company does. Uh, when I started off, I worked for companies like GE, General Electric. Uh, they did all kinds of things. They make any, everything from light bulbs to jet engines to plastics to locomotives to uh, home appliances. Like, they do a lot of different things. Now, I mean, if you work in light bulbs, for example, you're probably not going to know much about locomotives. So those are separate business units, right? And they were looked at separately. And that's very similar to an investor looking at the different revenue streams that they have. You know, maybe they uh, bought a house or something and that makes the money. Maybe they have some stocks and shares in the bank. That makes the money. Uh, maybe they have a restaurant or something and that makes the money, right? So they're looking at these different things and they're deciding what they do about it. Okay. And just in a nutshell, because this is very dry, I'm not going to go on for this for very long, but basically that job or the most important thing you do in that job is you look at each of these business units and technically, technically what you do, if I'm going to get all technical on you for a second, is you look at how they're performing 
And what that means is like you try and get an estimate of their net present value and you compare that against their book value. How's that for being dry? Okay. And the idea is that like, if you paid this much for this thing, it should be making you X amount of money. And if it's not, then you have to decide what to do. Okay. Uh, so you have several options. You could fix it. Okay. Maybe it's just not being run properly. You fix it. Okay. Or you could sell it. Right. Or you could liquidate it. You just terminate it as a, as a business entity. You lay all the people off. You sell all the equipment, sell all the pro whatever, whatever they have. Right. Okay. I mean, that's, you know, something, or you could just decide, uh, there's other things you could do. You could decide to harvest it is, is, is a term they use, uh, where you don't put any money into it, but you just get, you know, money coming out. Usually that's like in this, in a state of decline as it, it's a long tail, you know, maybe you've invest, invested in fax machines, right? I don't know if anyone else can name me something that's on its way out. I mean, I know fax machines are kind of, they're over, but, uh, something that's on its way out. Are DVDs on their way out? I think they are, right? Blu-rays, like physical, optical media, they're on their way out, right? Um, that makes me sad to think of that. I like Blu-rays and things like that. I'd much rather watch a Blu-ray. I, I didn't buy into the whole streaming thing, but that's just me. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, you could harvest it. You could hold it. Maybe, you know, it's, mar it's market conditions that just need to improve, something like that. Uh, so anyway, that's corporate management. You're sitting on top of all these different things and you're looking at them and you're trying to, you know, you're constantly, uh, checking in with them and you're just, and you're monitoring them and you're deciding what to do about them. If they, in your mind, they should be doing better. Right. So there you go. Uh, so that is a different world. That's like similar to the world of investment investment. If you're an investor, you think like this, uh, very finance oriented. Um, that's corporate management versus intra SBU management. Now, if you're the head of a division, you kind of have to wear both hats. You have to know about both worlds because your job is going to be running your business operation, your business unit, but your bosses think this way in terms of corporate management. They're going to be looking at like how much money you're making versus how much does it cost us, right? They have a very cold way of evaluating that. So there you go. Um, Okay, so we start to have people in the chat. So that's good, because I'd like to respond to questions rather than just do a monologue. There are 19 of you guys here. Thank you for being here. Uh, get in the chat, ask me some questions. Uh, we got Mike. Mike says, good morning, Bill. What's an example between effective management versus micromanaging? Is it taking total ownership? Um, okay, well, I don't know if there's like some kind of academic official definition of micromanagement, but... Uh, whenever I've heard that term, it's always been used in the context of some overbearing boss that uh, doesn't trust you to do your job, and they insist upon looking over your shoulder and second-guessing every little tiny thing that you do, right? That's, I think, the uh, definition of micromanaging that we all know and love, right, whenever we hear that term. So it's a bad thing, okay? It's, it's kind of a derogatory term if you say to a boss that they're micromanaging you. That's kind of like a bad thing, okay? And you usually get that in enterprise, like in big companies. It's very, very rare that you get that in like the small business startup world, okay? Because there's two different cultures here. In the small business startup world, it's a culture where people are expected to take initiative and get things done and uh, just take care of the details, right? That contrasts with the sort of corporate world where they do the opposite. They intentionally don't want employees to take initiative. They don't want employees to have any real power uh, or decision-making power. They want employees to uh, ask for permission before they do something, get approval before they do something. And that all stems from the fact that they just don't trust employees. And you get that at every level. It's not just the low-level workers. You get that like frontline managers. When I was a frontline manager, I felt that way. You know, you were given like a certain amount of leeway to run your operation the way, you know, you saw fit. But at the same time, they really expected you to like, like, operate out of a rule book. You know, you don't really make decisions, you just follow the rule book, right? 
Like, for example, a police officer dealing with an incident, they're called to investigate something. They can decide how they handle that situation, but really they don't have any real decision-making ability because they're supposed to be following a, a guidebook, a handbook of protocol of how police officers make decisions. Like, what do you say in what situation? What's reasonable? What's not? Right? So really, are you a decision maker? Not really. You're just following the playbook, right? You go higher up, you get to be like a uh, area manager or a functional manager, whatever you are. And sometimes you get the same thing. It's still possible to be micromanaged. You know, your bosses look at you as some kind of um, administrator, accountant, somebody who, whose job is to go through procedure rather than somebody who's allowed to make any kind of decision. And they insist upon making all those decisions for you. And, uh, you know, looking over your shoulder, getting involved in the details of what you do, and then second guessing your decisions, right? Uh, it stems from a lack of trust. And I've seen people do that for a variety of reasons. I've seen people that are promoted above their ability. And so they're just, they're not comfortable in their job and they're paranoid. They think that like everybody, all their underlings are going to like screw them over or let them down. You know, they don't want to take the fall if one of their underlings makes a mistake. So they insist upon micromanaging their underlings. You know, I've seen, I've seen all kinds of stuff, a lot of different situations where you get this. But it's usually bad, okay? If someone's micromanaging, it's bad. Um, so, okay, coming back to your question, so what's an example between effective management and versus micromanaging? Okay, well, listen, in a perfect world, generally speaking, effective management would be making sure that you have confidence in your underling. Now, trust is not given. Trust is earned. So you have to... Um, you have to get that either by hiring the right person and, you know, giving them little opportunities to prove themselves, right? Like you say, okay, you take care of this. I'm going to, I'm just going to sit this one out. I'm going to let you deal with it the way you see fit. And we're going to observe the results. If it, if it turns out really great, awesome. You know, that's a sign that you're a very capable person that's worthy of my trust. If it blows up in our faces, and it's bad for you and it's embarrassing for me, then I may not want to trust you so much in the future. I might want to micromanage more, okay, or, or have more of a hands-on involvement in what you're doing, right? Now, in a perfect world, you would have built up uh, a team of subordinates that you trust. You know, you know they're all good. Um, you know they're ethical. You know they're competent. You know that uh, they know the rules. They understand what you want. They won't go outside of what's reasonable. They won't step outside of, you know, the rules or the protocol, right? And you can rest assured that unless they come to you saying, I've got a problem, everything's going smoothly, right? That, that's in a perfect world. A lot of times you get a job as a manager, you inherit your subordinates. Now, you don't know who these people are. You know, you might be told by your predecessor that they're good or they're bad or, you know, I don't know about this person, this person needs a little help, uh, you know, or this person's really new and, they, and they're just sort of in, they haven't gotten over the learning curve yet, they're still learning the ropes, right? So uh, it would then be your job to sort of like work with them. And as always, the biggest enemy is time. Like that's easier said than done because your time is limited. You can't be the personal tutor of like, eight people or something, eight subordinates, but still you've got your own work to do. Plus you got to be, got to be on top of everything they're doing. That can be very challenging. Time is always the enemy. So, uh, you know, effective management is you give people the tools and the training and the authority to get things done, to do their area of responsibility. Uh, you make sure that they know that like, okay, if, if, some issue occurs that's big or anything to do with this, you know, you get me involved. You, I want to know about it. Anything that's to do with this or that or that, or it's routine. I don't need to know. I've got, I'm really busy. I, I can't spend my entire day reading emails from my subordinates, about every little tiny thing they're doing, right? Uh, you know, so, I mean, that would be a starting point to answer that question. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Mike, that's a, that's a good, good uh, question. Good question to start us off. Yeah, like um, the number one thing to managing people, like, like when they talk about leadership and I, 
I, I know this is uh, the name of the um, the live stream leadership. That's, that's what we're talking about. But just when people talk about it in general, it's like this very cheap cookie cutter social networking advice about leadership. You know, a leader is never having to say you're sorry. A leader is like, you know, sacrificing yourself for the team no matter what. It's like, what? No. Um, you, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, but all aspects of leadership, being a good leader in general, what that word means, being able to influence others and have them want to work with you. Usually the biggest thing in there is communication. Okay. A lot of times, if you do not communicate with people, they get paranoid, they get upset, and they get angry, and eventually they leave. Right? Like, imagine if you had a boss that you just send emails to asking questions, or you left a phone message for them, or you tried to talk to them, and they're never around. And like, look, you know, I, I got to get an answer to this question, you know, you... You told me I have to do this. I don't have the authority to make a decision on this. You have to give me a decision. I keep asking you. I keep sending you messages, but you never answer. Are you going to consider that to be a good boss? No. Now think of the opposite. You get an answer promptly. Now what does that say? That says, okay, first of all, on the surface, I'm giving you what you need to do your job. Beyond that, it's saying, no, Dealing with you is important to me. Whenever you ask me a question, I make sure that I prioritize it, I give you the answer you need, and I do it promptly, right? That, that's a sign of respect. It's a sign of you're important to me. If you leave a message for someone saying, call me, call me back, and they never call you back ever, what does that say? That says, well, I'm probably not very important to you, right? So in addition to its function, its, its intrinsic function, Communication has a lot to do with morale. It has a lot to do with relationships, right? So it's the number one thing that you've got to do if you're certainly dealing with people, you're managing people, is communication. Now, imagine if you asked your boss, look, I got a question. You wanted to, uh, you don't want me to make a decision on this. You want to be the one to make a decision. So here's the issue. What's your decision? You ask that question. Now, imagine that they get, they get back to you and they say, they don't just say, well, here's my decision. They explain, here's why I'm making that decision. Here's my thought processes. Here's what's going on that you may not be aware of. Here's issues. Here's things that have been brought up in my past where I've, I've dealt with that before and it's gone wrong. Those are all the things informing my decision. So now you understand where I'm coming from. Now, wouldn't you prefer to get that? Okay, that would be even better, right? What does that say? First of all, there's intrinsic value. You're learning. You're learning from maybe somebody more experienced. They're sharing with you uh, how they do their job, how they make these decisions. So that might be useful in itself. Number two, it's, it's a sign of respect and the fact that they think highly of you by saying, look, I'm going to devote the time to explain myself to you. I mean... I could just end this in end this interaction in 30 seconds. I'd say, nope, and then slam down the phone. I could do that if I wanted, but I'm not. I'm taking an extra 10 minutes or whatever to explain so that you understand where I'm coming from. It's very important to me that you understand what's going on here and why things are happening. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of like, I have faith in you, right? And it improves morale, right? Communication is really the uh, central thing. So good leaders, I, I hate using that term, but it's true. Good leaders tend to be good communicators. Think of like work, work, workplace relations too. Like you have the workers, right? And then you have the boss. And maybe there's a change coming. Maybe there's a change to work scheduling or a change to the uh, rules of, you know, the workplace or a change to do with, uh, I don't know, I don't know, some, some, some issue. When people don't get communication from the boss, what's happening and why, they tend to get paranoid, they tend to get upset, they tend to have a negative morale, right? Your, the morale sinks. All things being equal, if you had a boss that comes out and says, look guys, you know, look everybody, here's what's going on, this is why it's happening. This is the thought process behind it. You know, 
Now, some of this came down from high up. Other parts of it are me. Okay, this is like my thought processes behind it. This is why I'm doing it this way. Okay, this is how it will affect everyone. And I'm open to getting feedback or, or answering questions. Like, let's say that was your, the way you communicate it. Uh, all things being equal, it would go well. It would go better. Even if it was a bad change, something that, you know, would neg negatively affect people. It would still go better because people might, some people will think, well, I disagree with this, but I kind of understand why they're, why they're doing it. You know, it's not that they're trying to be jerks. It's just that they have no choice. I mean, you know, it just doesn't make any money if they do this and they can't do something that doesn't make money. I, I understand that. You know, so it's all about communication. Anyway, that's, that's probably my monologuing for today. There's 19 of you guys here. If there's anything you're wondering, get in the chat. And I will be only too happy to potentially go on another monologue. Maybe even get riled up while I'm doing it. So you got that to look forward to. Um, but no, this is, uh, this is for people that want to get into the world of executive management. And uh, a lot of pe some people have an ambition to do it. Okay. And it can take many different forms. You know, you can do it in large enterprise. You can do it in small business. You could make big decisions in small companies. Okay. Um, you're still an executive manager dealing with the same type of issues, needing the same type of skills, and so on. Right? Mike says, a good leader knows how to follow is a good listener values relationships and communication yes that's true but also there's another side to this okay it doesn't mean that people have an infinite amount of time usually a boss has less time than workers so they can't just be a babysitter for want of a better word okay um everybody has their job right? The workers have their job. The boss has their job, right? Now think about like, okay, think about this. Let's say you're a worker. Let's say you're some kind of machine operator, tradesperson, whatever. Okay. You have a customer that comes to you and says, you did this work for me. Well, here's my feedback. I think that you need to take a bit more care with this. I don't like the way you left your tools all over the place while you're working. You dropped several F-bombs while you were on my property, you know, like doing your work, talking to your compadre there. Uh, you know, now, is your job to listen? And if that happens to you, do you listen to these people and do you change your behavior because of what they say? Now, some people will say yes. Some people will like, yes, you know, like, uh, that it, it's good getting feedback. I don't always agree with it, but you know, I at least makes me aware that people feel this way or, or this was the impression I was making, or this is what's important to people, right? Do you follow it? Some people say yes. A lot of people say no, right? That's kind of the way it works for a leader. The leader, like, and, and when I say leader, I'm talking about a manager from general manager up. Okay. Yes, technically what you said is true. You know, they, it makes sense to try and listen to people, to invest in the relationship, have everything go smoothly, right? Uh, makes people, people feel good. Is it technically a part of their job? No. And is it always fun to do? No. And, you know, you've got your own work you're responsible for, and this is like taking up your time, right? So it's a matter of balance, right? And, uh, I mean, I've worked places as I'm, as I'm sure you guys have where, you know, people gripe and people complain constantly and no matter who you are or in what role you're in, regardless of what role you're in, you feel that no one listens to you. You know, a lot of people above you and below you are idiots and, uh, you know, they should listen more and they should take your suggestions because in your world, in your mind, what you see is the right, like your opinion is the right opinion to have. Right? Everybody feels like that. Okay? You feel like that. I feel like that. Everyone feels like that. Okay? Um, so sometimes people have legitimate issues that need to be addressed. Other times it can be noise because people like to complain. Everyone does. I like to complain. You like to complain. You know? 
you know, so just because a boss doesn't listen to everything you say doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad boss. They have to get work done. And if they're not doing things they should be doing because they're doing, uh, they're listening to a lot of noise. That can be bad. Now, I'm going to, like, I'm saying this. A lot of people will shy away from saying this. If, if I was uh, representing a company right now, I would never say this. But it is the truth. You know? Everyone wants to be perceived as, oh, yes, you know, I will all, my door is always open. I will always listen. Right? I'm sure you've seen that. They want to get this image out, you know, of like, yes, you know, come and talk to me. Of the people that do that, and then they get inundated with people coming to complain to them or share their, you know, suggestions. How many of those are actually listened to or taken? Not many. You know, so, so the, the, the most important thing to do is to uh, have a good relationship with your subordinates. If you trust your subordinates and you get to know them and you, you know, invest in those relationships, that's good. It's like, but think of like the military, you know, you have the soldiers, you have the sergeant, right? To be a good sergeant, to a degree, you have to listen, you know, to the people in your unit or whatever you call it. But do you dance to their every whim and fulfill their every request? No. And if you did, would that make you a better leader? No. Right? So it's a question of balance. There you go. I think I've lost about 30% of my audience just saying that. <laughs> but that's okay, because that's, that's, that's the truth, unfortunately. See, what people like to hear is they like, they, like, they like this perfect thing where like a leader is always supportive and they always listen and they have an infinite amount of time to deal with everything that you want them to deal with. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Now, those of you that have been in management positions, you know what I'm talking about. You would like to. It's not like you don't want to listen to people. You would like to, but there's just not enough hours in the day and there's not enough energy, right? To do every suggestion and to listen to every thought or every suggestion. It's just not possible. So how do you manage that in the real world, right? That's the big question. You know, you listen to people for big stuff, but for little stuff, it may not be practical. And for the little stuff, that should go through your immediate supervisor anyway, right? If it's not one of your direct reports. I'm not getting a lot of questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please let me know in the, uh, write them in the chat box. Because this is, uh, I, I don't really have a script or, or an agenda of what to talk about. I'm just sort of flying by the seat of my pants here. I figured I'd answer questions. So we got some great questions so far uh, from Mike. Mike asked two great questions. So, that, or, or said two great things anyway. That's uh, great to react to. But we need more. So, get in the chat, people. I'd love to talk about the subject more. Um, you know, I could just pick a topic and, and go, but I don't think that would be the best way of doing this. Um, yeah. So. Okay, maybe I will do that. Um, I don't know. What could I talk about? We talked about sort of corporate strategy versus business unit strategy, right? Corporate strategy is more like investors where you're sitting on top. Actually, the train, if you're wondering, if you were here at the beginning of the live stream, like, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, um, when I was talking about corporate strategy versus business unit strategy, that's where corporate strategy is where you're sitting on top of a bunch of business units and you're sort of managing or stewarding the business units. Okay, you're looking at how each one is performing. And the big basic metric for that stuff is you look at their, their net present value versus their book value. If you had an accountant here, that's the uh, metric that, you know, I would, what I would say to them, basically. Now, yes... Net present value, I mean, that, that, that's variable. Book value sometimes is a little variable, but um, that's the basic idea, right? If, it's, if, if it's, you have a business unit that they uh, own $2 billion worth of buildings and equipment, you know, and you're spending, I don't know, a billion dollars a year paying employees and, you know, keeping the business running, 
you would expect more than a $10 profit at the end of the year, right? Obviously, right? That's, it's that kind of thing. So for that amount of investment, you're going to expect a certain return, right? Now, the interesting thing is that let's say you're not at that level yet. Okay. You're a bit lower. Okay. You're kind of at the business unit level. So you're dealing with the business unit. You're trying to sell one product. So you're a manager that has a sales department and an operations department. You've got HR and IT and all your services. And your job is to make more money. You're going to want to increase your revenue. You're going to want to control your costs at the same time, right? Th that's your job. Now, you're actually kind of doing this activity anyway, right? Uh, like what I described with corporate management, where you're thinking like an investor, okay? Because if you want to buy, say, a new piece of equipment, um, you want to buy a new, I don't know, thing, doodad, that, like the, that, uh, I don't know. I, I, w years ago, I, I was touring some factories in the States, and there I was looking at these uh, industrial paint facilities, they had these giant, when on a small scale, you call it a paint booth. On a large scale, you still call it a paint booth, but like you can get a whole school bus in there. Uh, you know, and then you just paint something, and you have these people that work all day doing industrial painting. And um, it's usually the last stage of manufacturing and, you know, industrial products is now that you built this thing, you paint it as the last step. And, uh, you know, people said, well, we want to upgrade. Look, look at our facilities. It's kind of amateur. They make industrial grade paint boots. We should buy one. And it would cost like half a million dollars or whatever. And the thing is, you look at that purchase, that paint booth. It's really a project, technically, is what it is. Okay, we're going to install this paint booth. We're going to, you know, train everybody on its use. We're going to maybe hire people to operate it, uh, maybe a few more people. We're going to uh, maintain it and repair it and all that kind of stuff. It's a project, but it's going to shave off X amount of time for our production process. It's going to give us a better product. So it's going to make us money in, in a sense, right? That's why you do it. So you look at that project. In the same way that they do corporate management, they look at like, what's the net present value of the paint booth? How much money is it going to make us? What's the benefit? Okay, like in terms of time saved or, you know, extra sales because we've got a better product. What's the value it's generating versus what, what are its costs? What's its book value? Okay, uh, the value of all its, like, like all of that is in the net present value. So we're looking at that. So when somebody, some employee comes to you and says like, I think we need to buy this piece of equipment. The obvious question is like, okay, so that piece of equipment costs half a million dollars. Explain to me how that's going to make us more than half a million dollars, say a year, you know, or, or every three years or something like that, depending on what it is. And a lot of times employees will have like, they won't have an answer to that. It's like, oh, no, it's just nicer. It's like, well, yeah, you see, I can't do that. I'd like to do it. But, you know, if I'm going to... If we're going to spend that much money, it has to make more than the money that we're spending or we're not going to do it. That's how you make some of these decisions, right? That's certainly in the background, right? So that's how you cut your teeth on these type of decisions to work in corporate management if you're still at the business unit level, okay? If you're running a business operation, you can regard every project, you know, as an investment. So somebody says, we need a new employee training program now this is not because some new law came out that says we have to have one this is kind of an optional thing we think it'll provide benefit okay well what i want to know as a manager is how much is that going to cost do we have to hire new people do we have to take people away from their duties their their, their production to sit in class to learn this stuff okay so what's the cost and when, when are we going to incur the costs over like a schedule? And what's the benefit? Right? What's, how is this going to benefit us? How is this going to make us more money? Is it going to allow our salespeople to make more sales? Is it going to allow our customer service people to be more skilled, uh, to, be, to have better abilities with customers, better rapport that will make more sales? Like, like explain to me how this is going to make money, why we should do it. Because I, I, I don't spend money for no reason. I spend money to get a benefit, like a, like a tangible benefit, right? Right? So, I mean, that's kind of how you th start thinking like this, okay? It's not the only way of looking at stuff, but in the background, this is always there, okay? 
This is the financial side. And you regard any purchase or any upgrade or any expenditure as a project, right? Especially if it's optional, you have no choice. You got to do, you know, if you got no choice and you have to do it by law, you do it. It's just that simple. But if it's something optional, you don't have to do. Why would we do it? Well, it's because we're going to make more than we spend. That's why we're doing it. This will enhance our capability so that we can make more money. We can gain an edge over our competition, blah, 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 whatever in numbers. And you got to speak the language of numbers, right? The language of business is money. So if you want to be in the world of management or certainly upper management, you got to talk money. It's going to cost this much. It's going to make us this much over two years. How'd you come up with that? Oh, like this, this is the breakdown. You know, because our salespeople will be this much more effective, we're expecting an extra 5% sales just from this. Why do we say that? It's because we lost that many customers and in the complaints they said it was because of this. Well, this will make sure that we don't fall, we don't make that mistake again. So we will not lose those 5% of customers. There you go. So that's the, where the revenue is coming from. Anyway, we got questions. Dr. Sid, my good buddy, Dr. Sid, who's a member of my channel. Um, please advise ways to motivate employees when working in a public government institution. Oh, that's a challenge. If they're in a government institution, I don't know if you can always, mo mo if it's physically possible to motivate them. Uh, it depends what you're doing. Uh, people in these institutions usually are promoted only based on seniority in the same org and not on performance. Yes, that unfortunately is a thing. I'm not a big fan of that. That's a one of the reasons I left the corporate world and don't like dealing with government institutions because of that. You get a lot of disgruntled people in there and then they promote them. I've seen that. Now, you know, maybe that's not representative of what's going on in the wild, wider world. I don't know. But that's what I've seen. Okay, personally. So, um, so how to motivate them? Well, listen, how to motivate somebody? Uh, that's a great, oh, that's a great question. That's, that's awesome, Dr. Sid. Thank you for bringing that up. How to motivate somebody. Okay, forget about the specific situation you mentioned. Let's just talk about that for a second. Because the answer is basically following the, the universal sort of process here. Um, okay, hopefully you guys have heard of like just sort of basic things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I mean, this isn't the answer, but this is on the way to the answer. Let me see if I can, uh, just for want of uh, something here, Maslow's, there, look at that, it's like, it's like on speed dial on Google, as it were. Okay, this thing. Is there a picture? Images? Oh, this, yeah, this is Google again, so you can't, like, click on the picture. It takes you to a website. Uh, well, it's not too bad. Okay, let's see here. So this business, right? So this is always in the background. This is, like, universally true. This isn't some management theory flavor of the month baloney. This is actually true. So, I mean, you know, people care about food, water, shelter, clothing, you know, before they, you know, before they care about things like their health and security, you know, they only care about like this love and, but like, I don't know why they called it this, but uh, like friendship, family, intimacy. They only care about like having good relationships. This is more of a, this is not really a workplace thing. This is, I don't know, somebody wrote their own stuff in here, but, um, and people are adding to it. This is what I don't like. People take the original theory that worked and add their own little tweaks to it, which don't work. And then you get something that's watered down and it's not really true anymore. Um, and they're all using the same terminology too. Look at that. That. Okay. Weird. Okay. Um, this was, this used to be called like personal needs, you know, relationship needs. Anyway, so people care about their physical well-being before they care about things like realizing their ambition. Hopefully everybody realizes this, okay? Um, so this is like your physical, you know, I need food, shelter. If I don't have those, I don't care about anything else. This is safety. I need, I, 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 you know, I have food and I have shelter, but, you know, maybe I could get bullied or beaten up on the job or, you know, where it's a dangerous work. You know, then I care about that. I care about safety. And then only when those two are met do you care about uh, the third step, which is like, you know, I care about 
people being nice to me and people treating me with respect, right? And then if you get that, then you care about stuff that makes you feel good about yourself, right? I feel like I'm giving back. I feel like I'm valuable and I'm contributing something. And then if you get that, it's like, then I want to realize my life ambition and be the best version of myself I could possibly be and fulfill my potential, right? So that's the order you need. So if people aren't getting this, it's safety needs, they're not going to care about you giving them this, right? So this is always in the background, okay? So so we know this but beyond that this is the step that nobody does because they they don't want to really put the time into this is you got to get to know the person or the people you can't just assume you know what they would respond to okay you can't a lot of people think they can and that's where the whole thing fails how many times have any of you guys been to like a corporate you know, a team building exercise or some BS that they do at work that's designed for extroverts or it's designed for people that are sports fans or, you know, some like that. And maybe you're an introvert or maybe, you know, you're an extrovert, but you don't care about sports. You're more into like movies and, you know, art and that kind of stuff. So they're like, okay, we're all going to this retreat. It's mandatory and you've all got to play football or something, you know? And it's like, everybody's thinking like, oh God, you know, do we, do we have to do this? Can I get out of this? But no, it's supposed to be like a team building thing. And if you show a negative attitude, like, you know, you, you're not interested, you're not motivated, then, oh, they label you as like a bad person. You're, you're, you're a problem employee or something. It's like, have you ever been to those? That's because they're assuming they know how to motivate you. Like, ah, oh, we'll make it, we'll give them some sports. Make, it, make them all do competitions and play sports. Uh, people love that, right? It's like, no, no, not everybody does, you know? If they did it with art or, you know, let's all do this, like, let's all paint pottery together or something as some kind of team building exercise, that would not work either, right? Because they're just sort of making the assumption that this is what you like to do. So a lot of times people fail at motivating others is because they have never taken the time to really understand what that person's situation is. Not just with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like where you are and that, but you know, like who, what type of person are you? What are you into? What, 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 what do you want? You know, what excites you? Like if I bring, I remember like, 30 years ago or something, I was like a frontline supervisor. It was like my first job as a frontline supervisor. I asked all the employees, I was like supervising tradespeople. I, 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 I asked them, you know, I want to do something for you guys in return. Like, like, you know, you give me what I want. You do the work on time and quickly and, and, and properly. And I'll give you what you want. Now, what do you guys want? You know, because I've been told by other supervisors that I should bring in donuts or something for everybody. Is, I mean, is that what you guys want? And they said, no, no, we don't care about donuts. Half of us are, you know, diabetic. You know, we, we can't eat that stuff. We're old. You know, we want to go home early. If you could let us out like half an hour early so we can beat traffic. I mean, that would be a big deal. And I said, okay. And I did it. Now, I got in trouble for, for doing it, but I stuck to my guns and I still pushed back and, and did it. But, uh, you know, it, it, stuff like that. It's like just assuming somebody, you know, you know what's going to motivate them. That's your first mistake. So, so how do you motivate them? Talk to those government employees, okay? If these are people that, you know, you're supervising or you're managing, you know, talk to them. Like, find out what, what, what do they want? What's their living situation what are their hobbies what you know what are they into and run ideas by them like what do you think if we decided to do this what, what what do you think of that and get their feedback you know and it might not be a one size fits all thing if you're talking about multiple employees you know so so that's the beginnings of that get to know people get to understand what what motivates them what they would like and then think of ideas Okay. And you say, okay, you know, like, I'll tell you what, you, you do this for me and I'll do that for you. I mean, do we have a deal? You know, does that, what does that sound like to you? Does that sound okay? You know, things like this. I mean, it's about doing stuff like that. And that tends to get some positive results if, if it's done properly. So hopefully that makes sense. 
I've lost a lot of my audience, so maybe that was boring or something. But that's but that's what I would say to that. So thank you, Doctor Sid, for 1983 for that uh, that question. That's another great question. We got some great questions today. We don't have a lot of questions, but the ones we got were pretty good. So yeah, get in the chat. Let me know. I'm just going to close down Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, they've changed the. Uh, here, I'll show you what, what I'm looking at here. They've changed how this works. I mean, there's five. There isn't more than five. You know, like, so, like some of these, like they've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, they, they've like, look at that. Look at this one here. Didn't, like, is this, Ma I mean, Maslow, I don't know much about this guy Maslow that came up with this, but I've never seen like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No. I mean, my understanding is that Maslow died years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if somebody is adding to his work and calling it Maslow's work. That's not, that's not how it works. And if it does work like this, it might not be universal. You know, so I, I'm always mistrustful of people who change other people's work. That happened for things like um, the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Now, I might be swimming uphill with some people on this, but I was actually a big believer in that because it was so simple, because it was basic. You know, are you an introvert or an extrovert? What do you do for fun? Do you hang out with a million people or do you just go off by yourself? That's pretty simple, right? But they took that and other people tacked on a whole bunch of crap to it and they started to try to predict if you would be good at jobs and make all these predictions. But it's like, that was never part of this. And then after years and years of that, they, uh, they grumpily conclude that, oh, well, this doesn't work. Well, yeah, it, it, no, it doesn't. It worked when it was simple, you know, because it was basic. But after it's been tweaked and, and inflated with all this garbage, then it doesn't work anymore, right? But they throw the entire thing out. They say, like, oh, the whole thing never worked. It's, yeah, it did. It totally did. When it was simple. But it didn't make the predictions that you guys say it made, <laughs> you know? So anyway, anyway, that's a different matter. Yeah. So, um, there we go. Yeah. The last couple of days I've actually been uh, sick with a cold and, um, I can't tell if it's kind of a cold or it's just the Canadian wildfires, which you might have heard about. Because you get this sort of, this taste in like, you know, your sinuses in your mouth. And I don't know if that's because you're sick or it's because like, you know, there's soot in the air. There's smoke in the air and you breathe it in over long periods of time and it just sort of like coats your, <laughs> your sinuses or something. I, I'm not sure, but it's uh, not super fun. It's been a weird year in Canada. Uh, for wildfires and stuff, it's been a big issue. Uh, where I am, fortunately, it's uh, not really that big of a deal, but I know most of the rest of my country has been hit by those. So, yeah, unfortunate. Anyway, I'm not getting a lot of questions. There's 21 of you guys here. Thank you for joining me. Um, I like to sort of go off questions. So if you have any questions about executive management, being an executive, being a manager, uh, some of the challenges you might face, some of the skills you need, uh, you know, what you do in that role, you know, get in the chat. Okay, uh, the Dark Con, thank you, thank you for answering. Uh, what's the salary difference in terms of percentage between a project manager and a director? A director in my company oversees all the other managers, like 10 plus different teams. Also, and then it ends, so maybe there is a continuation. Um, I can tell you right off the bat, just having read that, director is a non-standard term. In different industries and different organizations, they use that word to describe different things. Um, I actually did a video for uh, years ago. For some people's, for some reason, people keep watching this video. It's one of the few videos I did years ago that still get regular views. Um, called the difference between a manager and a director, okay? Um, the short answer is that uh, one definition of director is manager of managers. 
Some companies use that term. A lot of others don't. Also, a completely different role that's also titled director is the uh, one of the owners of a company. Okay, so if you have a corporation and you have documents of incorporation, if it's like a, you know, on the small, it's not a publicly traded company, but like, the vast majority of companies are not publicly traded. So the, they'll ask for like a list on, on the, uh, the documents where you incorporate a company, say this is the name of the company and, you know, this is who owns it. They'll be list the directors and the directors are the ones that own the company. So they don't actually work in the company. They own it, right? Sometimes you get directors that are very hands-on and they'll be there every day and they'll be, a, you know, observing things. A lot of times you hardly ever see them. You might see them at a shareholder meeting or, you know, a director's meeting every quarter or something like that, but they're out of it. Now, I'm assuming that you're talking about director in the sense that they're a manager of managers, okay? Which is, I say, it's a non-standard term. So it's not like you can look up and say, oh, a director makes this much salary because it's a non-standard term. It's an informal term. Um, the other, I mean, the other thing here that complicates matters, and I, I know this answer so far is not helpful, but project manager, that means completely different things in different industries. A project manager could be overseeing like a hundred thousand people, a billion dollars of assets, uh, you know, all like, like huge areas of responsibility, or they could be like one person who works in a small business that does miscellaneous projects. You know, we need a new sign. Now we need a, a safety program. Now we need, uh, you know, to buy a new piece of equipment. You know, that, that all of those go to the project manager. So, you know, that's the thing. That also could mean so many different things. Now, what's the percentage difference? Okay, well, here's the deal. Uh, it's, it's not, you don't, don't think of it in terms of percentage. Think of it in terms of like every level of an organization, okay, the pay should go up because you have increasing uh, areas of responsibility, right? Like, for example, if you're a supervisor of workers, okay, the conventional wisdom goes that if you're supervising the workers, you should be paid more than the workers. It doesn't really make sense for you to be paid less than the workers because if anything goes wrong, you are responsible, right? And how can you supervise someone when you don't really know what they do or, you know, you don't have superior skills or superior responsibility? It doesn't make any sense. So, so the, the pay generally goes up, right? So the question is, what's the pay range for the project manager? Because if the director is their boss, their immediate boss, it's going to have to start above there, right? If you have an overlap, that creates all kinds of problems. It has to be like project manager here and then director here okay so if the director is has been in the company for 30 years they're at the top of the range they're up here right but you've just hired a brand new project manager they're they're 21 years old they're starting here it could be a, a significant difference or it could be a very slight difference if you have the opposite right um so that's how those things are kind of arranged it doesn't necessarily go off percentage difference and the percentage difference will depend on a how much money the company is making, how many levels there are, right? So for example, if there's only three levels, there's owner, director, project manager, and the company has five employees and they make $5 million a year, um, you know, the person at the top is responsible for making $5 million a year. You would have to, it, it, the only way you could get someone to stay in that job that's any good would be to pay them a competitive salary, which means that you know, if you're responsible for making five million a year, you're not going to do that for like minimum wage, right? You're going to do it for, you know, a chunk of it, maybe 10% of that, right? So, you know, potentially, right? Uh, and depending on a lot of other factors, you know, so if there's a lot of money, it means that, you know, the difference between those three ranges, you're going all the way up to having a high salary here. And then maybe the turnover for the, this role is very unskilled, high turnover, unskilled role. So there's going to be a huge difference. So the percentage difference between those two positions will be huge, right? So, so it really depends on the situation. You can't really go by percentages. All you can do is go by r the ranges, right?
So sorry about that. That was basically a non-answer for you. I'm sorry about that. I don't like to give those, give those, but, uh, um, what's the salary difference in terms of percentage between a project manager and director? A director of my company oversees all the other managers. Like the thing that they never really say, okay, this is an interesting thing about compensation. Something that they don't say is that your pay is usually a huge factor in determining your compensation is going to be how much decision-making power do you have over making money, right? So let's say you had a project manager that, um, you know, that uh, whether they did a great job or a not so good job, it didn't really affect the bottom line of the company that much, right? Then they're going to pay you less. But if you have a project manager that like, you know, your role is important. Maybe you're responsible for, in a smaller company, the entire branding for the organization. And if you screw that up, you could like, you know, decimate the sales of that company because nobody will want to work with you. You know, you've just published something that's anathema that, you know, like that nobody will want to work with you after they hear that about you. And like, that's what that, that all that was done by one person, right? Uh, you have a big responsibility. You better get that right. Cause that's, that has a huge effect on the bottom line of the company. They're going to pay you a lot more because you have decision-making ability you know, in that role, that's very important where there's roles of greater uncertainty. They pay people more. That's why like law, you know, sales, things like this, they pay people very, very, like very, very well, because the perception is that, you know, you can really affect the bottom line of the company a lot by how good of a job you do operations. They, for whatever reason, they, they feel that the general consensus is that it doesn't really affect the uh, performance of the company that much because the perception is like in operations, all you do, it, you do what you're told. You do your work to a certain specification or a certain standard. And if you can't do it, we get some, we've got someone else who will like, that's the perception. It's stupid because it doesn't work like that, but that's the perception. So they tend to pay people in operations less, right? So when we talk about project managers, these are all, huge like variables that will affect your compensation okay so the uh, the dark con continues uh those teams include other project managers sales managers marketing managers custom success managers the director has insight into the PL statement of his department he reports to bod whatever that is um yeah you know the problem is these are titles and depending on what the context is i mean these people could be nothing like they could have absolutely no real bearing over anything. Um, for example, was it Google? I don't think it was Google. Was it Amazon that had hired like teams and teams of all these people that just did like nothing. They had fancy titles. They were all like hired because of some kind of some executive had some crazy corporate fever dream that these are all things we needed to do. And, you know, and then uh, quarterly results came in. They didn't make as much money as they thought, and they fired them all. It had absolutely no effect on the bottom line, bottom line of the company, right? So the, the big question is, how important are these people? If these people screw it up, will it, will it affect, like, will the, will the company go out of business if these people screw up? So it's questions like that that really determine the compensation, right? If these are just people that have fancy titles, but they're just, uh, you know, doing what they're told, like they're just, you know, grunts, like workers, you know, that don't really have decision-making authority on anything, then they're going to be paid a lot less. It, it's a trend also to call people who are not actually managers, managers, to make them happy or something. I don't know. The director has insight into the p and well, they should, of his, de his department not the company, he reports to the board of directors. That's confusing to me because if you're a director sitting on the board of directors, you're an owner of the company. You have insight into a lot more than the P&L statement of your department. You got, you got an insight into the full financials of the organization, and this is in a private company. I'm not talking about public companies where you can just open an annual report. I'm talking about a private company. They have the crown jewels. This is the accounting. This is how much we make. This is how much we keep for ourselves. This is how much we give to the workers. This is how much we, we give back to the owners. 
right? So a director, if he's a true director, sitting on the board of directors, he or her, will have access to all of that, and then they will have a voting right in... For, the board of directors decides who the CEO is. I mean, they, they hire and fire CEOs. That's what the board of directors does, right? So if you're talking about that kind of director then uh, that's a whole different thing. You see, I was going on the first definition of director where you said that the project manager reports to the director. And I took that word to be used in the context of a manager of managers. That's one use of that word. The first job that I ever got, like in my corporate career, was technical director. That, that, that was my job. I was basically a frontline super, supervisor. Um, they didn't want to say shop gang supervisor or something they, they called it technical director which is stupid um so i thought you meant in that case like a manager of managers but if they're an actual director an owner that's just on the board of directors then there's going to be a huge disparity between their compensation and the compensation of a project manager right the project manager is going to be some form of salary you know or performance pay a board of directors will have their compensation will have multiple components. They may get some minimal form of base pay. Uh, they may get performance pay, but uh, you know, depending on if they actually do anything in the company. Um, but uh, they'll they'll be getting like their main compensation will be in terms of shares, share options, and you know, dividends basically, depending on how it's divvied out. So, completely different thing. But the first thing you got to do, Dark Con, is figure out, like, like, I'm a little confused. Is this a director that's on the board of directors, or is this a director who supervisors, supervises project managers who's under a CEO, for example? Right? Because they're two completely different things. Go watch that video, the, you know, like, the difference between manager and director. I break down, like, like what is a director? Where, when is that word used because it's used to describe a couple of completely different things so yeah anyway um there are nine or there are ten there are ten of you guys here um i managed to lose like most of my audience uh, in these long-winded uh, explanations. So that's probably my cue to wind this down <laughs> for today. I want to thank uh, Mike and uh, Dr. Sid and the Dark Con. You guys asked some actually really good questions today. Lots of fuel for thought there. Um, not, like they, they're, they're not stupid. They're actually very intelligent questions. Great ideas to, to build off of. So thank you for that. I hope you got some value. Um, I think I will do another one of these. I think it's like, this is still a sort of open experiment to see if people are, are into this stuff. But if you guys could give me, if you have any suggestions of what topics to cover, that kind of thing, what you're wondering about, uh, that would help me rather than just me talking off the top of my head, not knowing if anyone's interested. Uh, that'd be great. Um, if you want to learn business, I have a couple of courses. Uh, first of all, I got my get hired course. If you want to get hired, if you're wondering like how to get a job, how does that work? What are my options? I'm a bit lost in that world. If that's you, check out that course link in the description. But if you're wanting to learn business, you know, understand how business works. How do you make money? Uh, I have a course called the $100 MBA. It basically teaches you everything you would learn in a university MBA program. A pretty big boast, but it's true. And it's simply because it's a self-study course. You read the books that they use, the textbooks that they use in acclaimed MBA programs around the world, like Harvard Business School. You're getting the same material that they're getting. The only difference is that it's not being read to you by a professor and you're not having discussions in class. You're just reading the book on your own. Now, I provide videos that guide you through that material, but you are responsible for getting the books and reading it yourself. The great thing about this is that if you don't really want to go super in-depth, you just want to get an overview, you can do it. Uh, if you do want to go in-depth, you certainly can, but there's no uh, tests, there's no evaluations, nothing like that. So it is un it's, it's an, obviously an unaccredited MBA because there are no evaluations. I have no way of knowing if you got anything out of it. Uh, and 
that's not important. It's what you want to get out of it. How much do you want to learn in the world of business and what areas do you want to learn? This allows you to learn just one or two specific areas if that's what your goals are. So if that's a solution that uh, you know, you'd be interested in, check out the link in the description for that. Um, thank you everyone for being here. You guys are awesome. I'll be back next week with another installment of leadership uh, on this live stream. Let me know if you have any requests for topics that I cover because I'm looking to talk about things people are interested in. I don't know what that necessarily is and I'm having to guess. So uh, let me know in the comments if there's anything you want me to get go into. Thank you very much. I wish you nothing but the best and you're all improving yourselves, which is great. And if you keep doing this after a few years, great things happen and you will achieve a lot of your business related goals. Thank you so much. Take care.